únicamente dos veces, sino 25 de ellas, cada 12 años, que es un calendario eh, religioso, y que alberga 7 millones de habitantes, y lo que da con toda la infraestructura necesaria, la intensidad de sangre, agua, rutas, puentes, eh, y que luego eh, recoge o, o, o alberga 100 millones de peregrinos, y al cabo de dos meses se desarma. Entonces es como una, una, una cosa única en el mundo que fue, eh, gracias a Raúl, estudiada por, no solamente por el, 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 los arquitectos de, de Harvard, sino por toda la universidad eh, para sacar este, conclusiones sobre estos, estos fenómenos eh, migratorios, estas ciudades eh, efímeras, etc. Entonces, eh, tanto Oscar eh, Malaquina como este, Felipe Vera eh, fueron dos de los eh, alumnos de eh, que participaron en, en este estudio, que ahora los vamos a tener de, de panelistas. Eh, y nada, no, Raúl les va, les va a presentar este, este libro que es una es la conclusión de este estudio eh, y quiero invitarlos, quiero aprovechar para invitarlos eh, este lunes a las 7 eh, a escuchar la, la charla, la conferencia magistral de Raúl donde eh, no va a explicar un, una, no solo va a explicar eh, la, la, la investigación que está haciendo como oficina y como eh, parte de, 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 de Harvard, sino va a explicar eh, su obra en India y eh, realmente interesante, así que les invito a vernos nuevamente el lunes. Este, pues, Raúl, Raúl va, va a hablar en inglés, pero yo creo que no hay problemas. Este, todo... Thank you very much. I hope you said very nice things. So thank you very much, Jafir, Professor Kufa, others for for this invitation and to share this work. I'm very very happy to be here in Lima. It's a place that has always been in India in our imagination for many many reasons, and so I feel very blessed and privileged to be here with you today. Uh, in this afternoon, what I'm really going to share with you is the work we have done for this new book, which is called Mapping the Ephemeral Megacity. And I have this copy, which I'm going to present, and I hope uh, this can be in your library so all the students can uh, see it. Uh, it would be a pleasure if it's here. But I want to structure this presentation in a way that I want to first talk about some broader issues for maybe two or three minutes. Uh, then I'm going to show you just a small video clip so you get an idea about what this city that I'm going to discuss is about. Uh, and then I'm going to actually talk to you about what I learned from this city uh, and uh, why I think it's important uh, in terms of what I think we're trying to do for all of us collectively. And then I'll show you the slides so that you can see what the place is and then I will hope my colleagues Oscar and Felipe might also add some of their experiences uh, to it and maybe even in Spanish if it's easier uh, for the audience. So I work in Mumbai. I'm going to talk on Monday evening much more in detail about architecture. But it's a city which I think is an extreme form of uh, many questions that you're also dealing with in a place like Lima questions of inequity of the poor and the rich, of many binaries that are created in our environment. In Mumbai, it's a very extreme condition where it comes together, and so therefore it becomes a good laboratory to understand these problems. But the informal city that we call, I try not to call it the informal city, I call it the kinetic city because it's a city that is always moving and transforming. But this is an issue that we all deal with. And how do we understand formality? How do we map it? How do we learn from it? it becomes a big issue. We see it as a phenomenon. We can describe it. We can re-describe it. Uh, and I like this diagram very much. It's called the five stages of squatting. And you see the 
over five stages in one year, the person becomes part of the landscape. In the photograph, the person is in the third stage of squatting. Uh, the, the summer comes and he has a canopy uh, and uh, everyone it, it feels it's okay and he's happy and then the monsoon comes and it's a lot of rain, he makes a permanent thing and by the end of the year he becomes part of the landscape. So the whole city grows in these incremental, additive, accretive kinds of ways. Uh, and of course there's a big logic to it. It's related to what I call the index of security. The person on the top is the least secure. The person on the bottom is the most secure. Whether they have paid money and bribed their way into the system or the society has accepted their presence happens differently in different cultures. But there's a whole typology that we can um, study. And so this is a very interesting phenomena in all our cities where more than 50% of the city is actually growing by a logic that is not about formal planning. It's an informal planning logic and we all understand it. I'll on Monday evening talk much more in detail about this so I won't go into the details. But now today what is happening if you put on CNN and I'm sure all your local news channels uh, till the Santiago and the Chile earthquake came into the news, what is happening is now we are seeing complete cities being made through this informal informality. This is Atari, this is in Jordan, where a few million Syrian refugees are living now. Will this become permanent or will this be temporary? We don't know. These are complete cities of refugees that are occurring there. And if you open your uh, television, this is what you see. You see people entering Europe, just walking through Europe to Germany because they feel they'll have a better life there. They're going up, and this is just from yesterday's news. So this is fresh, 24 hours. There is a big movement of demography across this planet today, uh, which is creating an amazing sort of uh, condition and situation. And what it is also doing is it is challenging what is the role uh, of architects? What's the role of planning? What's the role of design in this? How do we imagine these new places? Uh, and we always imagine permanence as a given condition. Uh, but I think in this, on this planet we are going to have to deal with now the temporary in much more rigorous ways and I think design can play a big role in doing this. Uh, imagine 500,000 500, people going. Some of these towns in Germany are not even as big as the amount of people that are going to come into these towns. The towns are going to double. Do these become camps? Uh, this is what is happening in Dresden. Uh, the Germans are making camps where the refugees can live. So these are camps. Uh, can they become cities or is it assumed that they'll be sent back to Syria? Or will they be integrated in the new town? Can we think of better temporary problems, uh, of solutions to these problems? But this is going to be a very, very large issue, especially for your generation of architects uh, everywhere in the world, whether because of climate change, people will have to move, that there are earthquakes, there's water rising, there's a drought, and people will, in millions, leave parts of the world because they don't have enough food and water. I think climate change is going to create new forms of movement, which is going to challenge us as architects in terms of how we can imagine space, whether temporarily or in the more permanent kind of paradigm that we sort of lived in. So you see, it's already 4 million Syrian refugees. Uh, these numbers are very big. And I just wanted to share this with you just to contextualize where we are in the world and why some of these other things that I'm going to share with you could be important in the way that we look at it. How do you map informality? How do you map the temporary? How do you question permanence as the basic assumption? Why do we, if somebody told you to design a house for a weekend house or a holiday house, but they only want to use it for three years and then they want to remove it, how would you design it? And what this is about is imagine if somebody came to you and said, design us a city for 7 million people for 55 days. How would you design it? And this is what I'm going to share with you because what I'm going to show you is a city that is made for 55 days for 7 million people to live there, but for about 100 million people to visit over the 55 days on five very sacred days. It's called the Kumbh Mela. This is a festival that happens in India uh, once in 12 years. It happens on the confluence of the two rivers, the Yamuna and the Ganges. These are two sacred rivers. And we Hindus believe that in those 12 years, on five particular days where all the planets in the universe align in a particular way, if you have a bath where the two rivers meet, then you are freed from rebirth. 
So it is a massive, it is a very powerful imagination in the Hindu mind that you can be free birth, freed from rebirth. And so people come to bathe here in millions. So it is the largest gathering of human beings on planet Earth, which happens every year, every 12 years uh, in, uh, in this location. starts today, will last over 55 days, and crores of people who will attend, here are the many facets of what makes the festival a vibrant and colorful one. These Akharas, once the training camps of warriors, are the nucleus of the Kumbh. They are now monasteries that host wandering sadhus and sadhis. Near a million people headed towards the Ganges River on Monday, with many more expected to arrive at the world's largest religious gathering kicked off. Tens of millions of Hindu pilgrims are making their way to Allahabad in the northern Indian state of Uttar Pradesh. They are arriving for the Mahakumbh Mila, or Grand Picture Festival, to base where the Ganges and Yumna rivers meet the mythical Saraswati River. Millions of pilgrims arrived in Allahabad as the Kumbh Mela kicked off. Uh, thousands were taking a holy dip in the Ganga. And the, this is, of course, one of the most important parts of the event, which takes place once every 12 years. Uh, the Kumbh Mela is seen as possibly the biggest gathering which takes place anywhere in the world. It's a 55 day festival. More than 100 million people are expected to visit the city. And Allahabad, unsurprisingly, has been preparing for the festival for months. A vast tent of the city has grown up around the river. Tens of thousands of families are camping on the banks of the river in anticipation of the festival. Fourteen temporary hospitals have been set up with 243 doctors deployed around the clock. 40,000 toilets have been built for the pilgrims. Police checkpoints have been set up on all roads leading to Allahabad and about 30,000 policemen and security officials have been deployed to provide security during the festival. So that is just a glimpse of what the crowds are. And it's an extreme case of what we are calling ephemeral urbanism. Urbanism that comes and it just goes. Uh, but it involves so many people. Uh, and so why did we get interested in studying this? I think partly for the reasons I've already shared with you. But also, you know, there were two really very important reasons for us to study this. One was we looked at the literature that existed on this festival. This is a festival that's been happening for 5,000 years, and there are records from that time that the festival actually occurred. Uh, it was made much more systematic by the British, because when the British arrived in India as a colonist, and I think some British officer from the army must have landed up there and seen millions of people just coming towards the river. They might have thought this is a revolution, so they need to do something about it. So they began to organize it in a more systematic way. But we saw that the literature uh, on the Kumbh Mela was mainly from scholars who talked about politics or pilgrimage or religious studies, or it was from retired officers who had been in charge of the festival. So it was just mainly statistics. But the main amount of literature, the most amount of books on the Kumbh Mela was by photographers, because it is very exotic. It's a spectacle. I mean, you take a camera, wherever you point your camera, you'll get a beautiful picture, because there's all these crazy things happening. And so photographers had done much. But we found that nobody had systematically studied this as a city. When 7 million people live in one place, even by the UN definition, it's a mega city. And it's an ephemeral mega city, and so we decided we should city it, study it as a city and an urban system. So that was one main goal. The second main goal was because it was a university project from the point of view of pedagogy. It was a perfect project for us, at least for me, when I first thought about it with the other professors, as an interdisciplinary project because it is such an out of the box problem. I mean, if you tell even a design school student that 7 million people, it's a city for 55 days, they don't know how to think about it. And so we thought that if we had a problem which nobody was confident about, 
thinking, then it allows many disciplines to talk to each other because every discipline then depends on the other discipline. And so it was a perfect project, we felt, for kind of interdisciplinary work. And that was the second goal. The questions then were, what can we learn from this? I mean, this is, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's the it's a, it's a ephemeral mega city. What can we learn from this? What can we learn for our own city? How do we map informality? How do we map the temporary was one big question. Uh, how can we rapidly deploy something? So in the case of an earthquake or in the case of a tsunami, if you have to suddenly make uh, homes for a million people, how do you deploy very quickly? That became a very big question. And now what we have done is we have extended this research into what we are calling ephemeral urbanism, where we are looking at landscapes of celebration for refugees, for extraction like mining towns, uh, for transaction, for markets, uh, for religion, for disasters. So we're looking at many categories where this might be actually uh, useful. Because we believe that something like this, for all of us uh, as a discussion, can open up new theoretical ways that we can also deal with our own cities and the notion of the temporary within our existing urban system. So we basically frame this as an interdisciplinary work. Uh, we brought in the field of public health, of pilgrimage and religious studies, of design, of business, of engineering, of governance and management, and of technology. And we went to all the schools in the university that had these departments and made them partners in the project uh, to try to understand the networks that actually create a city like this. Because we believe that from studying the city of the Kumela, we could learn about both planning and design, we could reflect about flow management and infrastructural deployment, but also about cultural identity and urban adjustment in this kind of elastic or temporary urban condition that we all live in. And so the big design question, of course, becomes is how do you design a city which has an expiration date? So when we buy a can of food or we buy medicines, we read at the back the expiration date. This is valid till September 2017. How do you design a city that has an expiration date? How do you design a city where people tell you that in 55 days we'll remove it? And this becomes very, very interesting. So we, we of course, set it up in terms of a structure as a seminar where we had people from all the different disciplines, students, faculties, where we divided the project to look at five stages, which was planning, which was construction, uh, in uh, assembly, then operation of the system, and then the disassembly or the removal of the system over the one year. Now, there were many learnings that we had from this, and there are many questions for the future, which maybe I will uh, you know, come to at the end, and maybe with our colleagues we can sort of discuss it. But now what I'll do is I'll just take you through the city to give you an idea of what a city like this feels like and this looks like. And I'm going to ask Oscar and Felipe if you want to jump in on some complex questions or even change languages. It might be easier. Please feel free to do that. Yeah? So this is the myth of it. What you see here is the goddess Mohini. And what she has on her shoulder is a pot with sacred nectar, which the gods had given her. Because from that nectar, she was to create the whole universe. So this is an imagination of the creation of the universe. And as all the different gods were waiting for little drops of nectar so they could create their own universe, the demons, the devils came and they started chasing her. You can see it on the top uh, picture because the demons, demons or the devils wanted the nectar because if they could get the nectar, they could control life. And they had a fight between the gods and the demons. And the fight was for 12 days, which are 12 celestial days, which means in human beings' time it becomes 12 years. And that's how every 12 years this rhythm uh, repeats. And in the process of the fight, four drops of the sacred nectar fell out of the pot. And they fell on four different spots in India, which is Hardwar, Alabad, Ujjain, and Nasi. And these are where the rivers become very sacred because the drops fell in that river. And in Alabad, where the two sacred rivers meet, it becomes even more sacred and becomes the most sacred spot. So Alabad is what we're going to look at. So, you know, there's this kind of virtual imagination, which is also ephemeral in a sense. It's, 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 it's not real, but it, 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 uh, it is powerful in, in some ways. And this is the city and what it looks like when it's made. 
uh, in Allahabad. You can see the river in the background. This is a small part of the city. We also looked at archives and we realized that in 1890, for example, even 1930, it was complete chaos. There wasn't a city. The people would come, millions of people would come. They would come with swords. They would fight with each other to get into the water at that sacred moment because it was a particular time on those five days. It was complete chaos. Uh, it was really like a big village that had been replicated and people would come with, from rural areas with just their basic huts. Even photography wasn't allowed and that's why there isn't much documentation. But then in the 1950s, it actually took the first form as an organized city. Before that, the British began to organize it. But after our independence, the first one was this one, uh, which was based on a town planning scheme, which is a basic flat grid. And that is the only document that sort of really exists uh, from the planning of the city. The British also made a lot of statistics. They measured who was getting sick, what were the diseases there. Uh, they also began to organize how people would have a bath, at what time which group could go so that there were no fights. So they began to bring systems into it. But it was really archival documentation uh, like this. This is the plan from the 2012 Kumbh Mela, which is the one that we have documented in this book, which is, and this is the only document that exists for the making of the city. This is the plan the government works on. And because of Chandigarh, now they have sectors. So each color is a different sector. That is the influence of modernist planning that came because the people who run it come from the urban planning departments from different governments. And so this is the only document, literally, there are some written documents which are meetings of minutes of meetings where people are told what to do. But in terms of planning, this is the only document from which the city is actually constructed. So the city sits at the confluence of the two rivers that you see in the black. This is a Google image from 12 years before. Uh, this is what the city looks like when you look at it from uh, the satellite image. The white is the sand because the, the, the river is usually flooded. In October, the river dries up and the sand is visible. And once the sand is visible, the city is made on the sand. So the people ha who have to make the city, they have the month of, from the end of October, so they have about six weeks to make this entire city because the people start arriving in January. And then it finishes in March, and for three months it lies, the sand, and then the monsoon comes and the city is flooded. The size of the city, if you know, that is Manhattan. So you can see the red, and it is about a little more, above Central Park, so it's as big uh, as that. But it is essentially a religious city about touching the ground and having a bath. It has 30 million pilgrims come on one of these five days. It is about the sacred bath. That's where the photographers love to document it. It lasts for 55 days. And like I said, it was really an interdisciplinary approach. We did these working seminars. We looked at religion. Uh, we looked at urbanism. We looked at business. We looked at technology. This was the first Kumbh Mela where there were cell phones because this was a very important thing. Because 12 years ago when they had the previous one, there were no cell phones. So how with cell phones could one create new networks? Uh, you know, somebody asked me earlier about smart cities. You can get a smart city. This is the smartest city I ever saw. It's about health and also it's about governance. How do you make these partnerships between these different groups? It's about engineering. And so what we did was, we didn't, we, I mean, we, we had no idea because there was no trace. There were some photographs from a previous Kumbh Mela. But we had to, as 40 students and six faculty, <coughs> imagine how are we going to study this thing? How are we going to map what is an ephemeral megacity? So what we did was we made hundreds of questions. Uh, we listed questions. I'm sorry you can't read it. But we made questions all the way from what happens if there's a stampede? What happens if it starts raining? Because you're not supposed to have rain in January in India. But supposing there's a thunder shower, what happens? Where do you charge your cell phone? Where do you go to drink water? Uh, how do you enter the place? So we asked hundreds of questions, which we made a very detailed list of. And then we got the different disciplines to take responsibility for different questions. So we got these different schools uh, involved, and they began to say, OK, you know, everyone began to take ownership for some questions in terms of answering it. And we began to create a network between the different disciplines uh, that finally became uh, the project. That's the group that went. 
we had our own big tent and every evening we used to meet after dinner and we used to have a seminar and a workshop so that whatever people had seen on the ground, they could come and share with other people. So someone from engineering might have seen a beautiful uh, religious festival and so the religion school people could go. We did many interviews with uh, the sadhus or the priests, uh, some of whom have come now for six of such melas because they've been around for maybe 50, 60 years. And then we captured all of this in the form of this book, which will be at your library. Uh, it had many sections on it, um, on governance, on the purpose, on lessons, on maps, and many other things. But just to give you an idea, even for our experience, so this is when we went there in, in, in July or August, where you see the, the whole monsoon is flooded. These are the two rivers. This is one river there. This is the other river. This is the sacred spot where the two rivers meet, so people go to bark. This is an island that is left, and this little road that you see here is the memory of a road from 12 years before, because that part of the river, did, the river did not cover that part of it. And if you see this tree, you see the leaves and the branches on this tree, in the next image, that's the same tree. And in six weeks, suddenly, or the whole city had appeared when we went back in January. So from the end of October to January, this entire city is built. So that's the, 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 the rivers. That's how the city gets built on the sand that you see there. We documented thousands of images, which are all now geo-referenced, so that it can become an archive. We will make it public soon. Uh, this is the kind of, uh, you know, the just samples of the different images of different people, of the religious people, the sadhus, the markets, the construction workers. Uh, it's a document that is quite sort of exhausted. But these are some before and after pictures that you can see. This is the same tree that you see here. It's the same tree and the same view. And that island you see, this is the road. And so the whole city gets built in these six weeks once the water recedes. Uh, and uh, it, it, it sort of opens up. This is the before and after again. This is the same temple that you see here and here. And you can see the whole city is built where the river dries up. And this is an aerial view that you see the same road, which is the same road. Uh, and it gets to the grid. This is the point where they come for the path. And we also have detailed documentation because it's a grid. And within the grid, each group organizes itself quite differently. But this is what the city sort of looks like. And it's interesting, and I'll talk to you about it in a minute, that every road becomes a bridge to go across. So it's a very robust grid because every road of the grid goes across uh, uh, the river. And that is in the making of the city, again, uh, the before and after. So it's about design and infrastructure, about how you look at it within the network of this, the country, because people from all these cities come there for that bathing. It sits within a state which has a very particular geography in terms of its rivers. Uh, and this is exactly where the, the city happens. Uh, but this is the network of water. These are the small towns. This is the road system. This is the railway system. I, the, the, sorry, the first one was the rail system. This is the road system. Because all the material comes from all these different places. But the material is also recycled. So the material from which the city is made also goes back to the small towns uh, and villages. But that's the river. That's the river when it's in flood during the monsoon. And you see, you don't see any sand. And when it dries up is when you begin to get city. And every 12 years, the shape of the city is completely different because it depends on how the river dries up. And this was the one from this last time uh, that we just talked about. So we did mappings just to try to understand the rhythm, the different operations that occur there at different times, the different things that happen, uh, the, 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 the watery terrain of the territory that when it dries up gives you uh, the, the city, and then how the grid is used because the grid is a very robust thing that even if the city shifts, the grid gets put on it. So even if the river is in a different point, the bridge goes over it. And that's how you get a very robust sort of, uh, grid because the context is always shifting. Uh, and so it's the deployment of the grid that allows it to happen so quickly. And as you can see, every road goes through as a bridge. So it's a completely uh, connected grid and therefore very easy to operate. And those are the bridges that are made for the grid. We also digitized um, under Oscar and Felipe's guidance uh, everything on, in the thing. So we have an AutoCAD base which has every tent up so you can actually do calculations of density and infrastructure for anybody who wants to research it. 
but we also looked at it in terms of time period with the existing railway systems, uh, at what time, what uh, operations were deployed uh, uh, to make the, the city happen. And this happened in, in, in different ways. Uh, the infrastructure, the light posts, the roads, the, the sewage lines, the water supply. And many, many interesting uh, learnings came out of this. And I think one very interesting learning for all of us, which was very exciting, is that the entire city of 7 million people was built by just these five materials. It was 8 foot tall bamboo, nails and screws, <coughs> string and rope, corrugated metal GI sheets, and fabric, plastic or textile fabric. Uh, and everything was made in a way that two people, three people could make it because it's very labor intensive. And you see that module of an eight foot pole, that goes for the entire spectrum of spaces. And that's only five materials make the whole city. This is very incredible, and that's the reason why they can deploy it so quickly. And this is not by design. This is just an evolution that has happened over maybe a few hundred years that people have realized the fastest way to do it and the best way to recycle it is to just use the minimum material. And this is a wonderful lesson even for the way we can deploy other things. And you see the scale of it. Uh, and then on a structure like that, fabric is wrapped and it changes completely. So it's one of the five materials, but in massive variations. And then it becomes community centers. There's song, there's dance all night. It's a very alive city. It's not like a refugee camp where you become disaggregate the units and people don't connect. Here it's about connecting people. It is about building communities. So the community spaces become very important. And it's all sorts of different architecture, just using straw and thatch uh, and bamboo. Uh, and the scale of this is massive, just in those seven, uh, in those five materials uh, that are used. And also there's remarkable engineering, these bridges, uh, they are roads that are made, these bridges are fabricated over a much longer time period, they're deployed on site, uh, it's very simple mechanism, those are anchors so that the pontoon doesn't float away. So these anchors are put into the sand. It's again very simple, very labor intensive, using the, the intelligence and the craft very much of the local people. Uh, and these are how those bridges are taken, uh, the pontoons are taken. As the river starts drying, you can see the river water is going back. They first start building the bridges, and after the bridges are built, you begin to start establishing the grid. So you can see now the government has started making the roads. The government makes the main infrastructure. Just the roads, the bridges, the electricity, the water supply, the sewage, and the sanitation. Within the grid, different people, private groups, religious groups are allocated parts of the grid and they do everything on their own. So it's a wonderful example of public-private partnership even in terms of learning for our cities that the government decides to centralize some basic infrastructure allowing a lot of flexibility to occur at the basic levels. So these are the bridges as they get made. We also made fabrication drawings of the bridges uh, and this is the roads. Uh, that are made, they're made from plates like the military makes roads uh, and it just allows, very few cars are allowed there because it's mainly people. Uh, this guy has a separate permit because he's supplying milk, so he's a vendor uh, and he's allowed to sort of go in there for older people. Sometimes they allow tractors like this to take them there because they can't walk, but that's how the roads are made. They're just plates, one truck comes, people take the plates out, they're bolted together there's water supply with these valves that you see control. Uh, this is uh, how the edges of the river are secured using the sand from the river put in the bags. So it's again just that local material, but it's put in the bags. Uh, it also creates water bodies for fresh water, for people to have a bath or for people to take for supply. And it's all these components that come together to make the city. Uh, there's also a sanitation infrastructure, which is very robust. So there are toilets, all the black Docks that you see are all the public toilets. Uh, there are different kinds of public toilets that we had mapped. Uh, they're different system. There are 10,000 people who are cleaning the city every day. Uh, so these are the sweepers. So this infrastructure, there are hospitals. I think there are 20 hospitals. There are many clinics. Uh, there is uh, incredible coverage. This is the health coverage. The big, big, big boxes that you see are the main hospitals. And they cover these zones. So it's like a complete infrastructure of a city. Uh, this is the bus stops where passengers can wait in these tents when they're waiting for their buses to come and go. 
this is we 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 documented all this before the crowds came because we were trying to understand the city. But this would be all full. There are fire engines, police stations. Uh, there are many NGOs that do all sorts of different social work to connect people if they're lost. Of course, there's the police. The security system is very interesting. What they basically do is very invisible. So the police they make a grid, uh, and the grid is each square in the grid is 10,000 square feet, 1,000 square meters, which is not very much. Maybe it's twice the size or a little bigger than that. And one police officer is in charge of 10,000 square feet. And so maybe there are about three, four, five hundred people who live in that 10,000 square feet. So for 55 days, that one police officer, not in uniform, in ordinary clothes, lives there and he's in charge of that or she is in charge of 10,000 square feet. It's very soft. It's very invisible. They get to know everybody. If there's anything odd, they just pick up their cell phone and they report to the main police station. And we experienced this because our photographer, we had told him to document all the substations and you know the phone lines and infrastructure. I think he was the only photographer in the Kumbh Mela photographing infrastructure because everyone was photographing the priests having a bath and all of that kind of thing. And when he went to photograph an infrastructure, the man stopped him and he said, what do you want? And he said, no, I'm with this group doing research. The, man, the policeman took a picture on his cell phone. He uploaded it to the central command. And in, within 15 seconds, they phoned him and they said, it's OK. Uh, so they were controlling it very finely in a completely <coughs> invisible way. This was very, very interesting uh, for us. So this is the grid of the police control. Uh, it's an invisible grid. It's very humane in many ways. But the main reason is, for these guys, these are all the priests. People go to consult them, to take their blessings, to talk to them, sometimes to maybe have a smoke of marijuana with them. Uh, but it's sort of, uh, it's really a place of celebration, meditation, retreat, uh, etc. But it is like a full city. This is the statistics. Um, uh, at any given time, 30 million people are in the city. The 100 million people come on five different days. But the whole city, the grid is designed to have 30 million people walk through the city uh, to the river. Uh, and uh, it has 163 kilometers of road, uh, which is a lot. Many of our cities don't have that many roads that are secured. But you can see the 10,000 sweepers, sanitation centers, uh, the 20 hospitals, ambulances, police. Um, it, it's a complete operation. And that's what it looks like on the, on the main avenues. The gateways are the, 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 the different neighborhoods you can enter. And it's all made in those five materials. The bamboo, the string, the nails, the corrugated metal, and the fabric. Those are the only five materials. They are kitchens. Uh, you can walk into any neighborhood, and you can sit down in the dining area, and you get a free meal. Uh, you don't pay for anything. Every neighborhood has its own community kitchen that is continuously cooking for people. So people who come there come with very little. They just come with their clothes, and they are there for the treat. And the community provides everything. And so it works as a real, some of these are smaller dining facilities, some are bigger. These are what the kitchens look like. They're different kinds of kitchens. They're markets uh, where people can buy these things. There are vendors. There are people selling flowers. There are people selling decoration, necklaces. There are people selling tea. There are small markets, uh, etc. So it replicates a complete sort of city. The governance is very interesting. Uh, the governance is the person who's in charge of the city for one year. He is a district magistrate, which means that he has the uh, uh, he has the power to call the police or the army if there's a crisis, and then he has the power of a mayor of a city. He's exactly like the mayor of a city, but he has the power to also call the military or the police if there's a problem. Uh, and so they just have this one map that they make. This was the map that they made this time. It has the different zones. Now some private groups make some maps for their own sectors, but otherwise nothing happens. Uh, and when the river is dry, that's when the, the, the zone for the city is allocated. Uh, and uh, they have a, uh, there's a whole government structure which we were trying to understand, uh, trying to understand how the sectors work. I mean, of course, I won't go into these details, but each sector has a different allocation of different religious groups. And you see also how the grid begins to break down depending on the geography, depending on you know, where it's dry, not dry, how much land they can get. 
uh, and I won't, I won't go into this, but the way we did this documentation is we called all the people who were in charge of the governance to Boston, and we interviewed them for two or three days, and from that we made these charts, uh, which have everybody who was involved in the planning and the execution of the Mela, and what their relationships were. And this was very interesting because we learned a lot from this, and I think it's very important for cities. What we learned was that during the planning stage, there was one hierarchy. There was one set of relationships which were top down. It means people from the central level were planning this. Uh, and they made a lot of decisions, they appointed a lot of people, uh, and uh, they also did a lot of coordination, but it was all top down. But when they went into implementation, it became bottom, which means the whole governance structure shifted into a different structure for implementation with very minimal connection. Now, the problem in a lot of our cities is the policy makers are also the people who are worrying about implementation. And here what we learned was the whole relationship flips completely. There are two different structures for policy planning and for implementation with a very few connections where people can consult each other just on a cell phone to make decisions within 10 seconds if they have to make it to be able to move very fast. And this was very important. And then within the bottom pyramid, then this man who was the chief commissioner for the city, he can go outside the circle and he can appoint private contractors, he can appoint different agencies that are not within the circle of command. <coughs> this is very, very interesting in terms of how we can respond to disasters. We can, because if you look at Haiti, you look at a lot of disasters, what happens is in the implementation and governance, because it's always top down, that you have a lot of problems, that you cannot deploy things very quickly. And this was a very interesting learning for us, that at different <coughs> stages, how those relationships were completely different, and how yet there was some contact between the bottom people and the top people, but those contacts were very minimal, so that you had no bureaucracy. Because bureaucracy is what slows things down, and if you have to do something so quickly, it's an impossible thing to do. This is what their office looks like. This was a man who was also the commissioner. And then how do you deploy? And of course, we studied this and mapped it in terms of time, in looking at the temporality, looking at the landscape, uh, which parts of the grid came first, uh, how they began to you know, implement it as the river began to dry up. So as the river begins to dry, uh, they begin to first you know, begin to align the grid as the main thing. So the first few roads and infrastructure goes out first. The bridges are the first thing. Then they begin to subdivide it as it begins to you know, get drier till the grid gets established. This is the establishing of the grid, which is the first move. Uh, you see it, the government makes the land flat because it's sandy, uh, and then they start putting the infrastructure. So here you have the electricity, you can see the water supply pipes being put in here. The contractors are given a small area where they can keep their material, but they have about three weeks to do this. And once this is finished in three weeks, which is very, very quick, then they give the land to the private groups who come and they do their own measurements, and they do their own markings. Then they do a prayer to make the land sacred. So they have their own rituals in order to establish where they will live for those 55 days. Uh, and then the city begins to get built. And then they have four weeks to build the city. And you see it's all the same materials uh, that I was describing. And in four weeks, this entire city is put together uh, with water supply, which can carry on on the grid. So while people are building the tents, the roads are free for the infrastructure to go in, for the sanitation, for the toilets, for the septic tanks, for the water supply, uh, and then the city begins to start growing uh, as people begin to uh, arrive there uh, for the festival. Uh, and then by the beginning of January, the whole city is sort of uh, established. Uh, and it's, uh, it takes on a different form, um, different sectors. Some are almost like a military camp, but every sector always has a community space. So every part of the grid, which is a community, always has a community space where people can meet because it is about meeting, it is about the community. And this is what the tents look like, people share it, it's very frugal, men live separately, women live separately, some sectors are very organic, some people even replicate their own villages, so 
this group has remade the same village square and the temple, but in temporary materials for 55 days. So every part of that grid is complete. Every neighborhood you go to, it's like a different world, because they use their own methods, their own belief, their own rules in ways that they can organize the built environment there. Uh, some are more structured, uh, some are less structured. Uh, as you can see, some are more organic. These are the main avenues. Uh, that go through it, and on some days it actually uh, gets quite crowded. And then this is the final uh, bathing day when people come, uh, the priests come, they dress up. Uh, you have massive peak uh, pressure because 30 million people come on, on these days for the bath, and you can see the pressure. And this is a very well organized bathing where everyone does not take, no one takes more than 30 seconds. They have a bath and they move, and the next person comes. Uh, and that's the only way. So these are a series of maps which try to capture uh, some of that. And the bathing happens all night, and it, you know because it's there's such a big crowd, so it's it's a, a nightly thing. And, and you begin to and these are maps that begin to understand how that movement happens and uh, which way do people move? There are one ways, and how do you get 30 million people to that one spot and then in and out of the city, having food, using toilets. Uh, you know, or, or all of that kind of thing. And this is on the last day where the main priests come and they begin to offer milk uh, as an offering to the sacred river. And then the, 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 the ceremonies are over and the city is removed. And within one week, the city disappears. Uh, everyone takes their tents and they go back. And all that is left is the roads. Uh, you can see the electricity poles which will be taken out and then given to the villages and the small towns. Uh, in the area, uh, and what you see are the mats under the tents where people were sleeping, and these are in patch, so these are decomposed uh, in the water. Uh, and you just see the memory of the city uh, in, a, in, a, in a way. Uh, and sometimes you see a little more things that are left, in this case the linga or the phallic, uh, which is worshipped. Uh, but the grid stays, and you see the memory of the grid. And what is very interesting is this finishes in March and the end of the March, so April, May, and part of June, before the monsoon comes, is three months. There's a grid on the sand. It's very well organized. So the local farmers, they take advantage of it. And they come in and they organize themselves on the grid to do farms because they get one season of vegetables. So they grow vegetables using the infrastructure and the subdivision. And they begin to actually make a field out of the grid. And they, for three months, then they grow vegetables because they have the three months. The land is flat. It's fertile, uh, it's beautiful soil, uh, and it's been organized for them. So even those three months are used very effectively. And then at the end of June, the monsoon arrives, it rains like crazy, and the river floods, and it washes away the entire city, and it actually leaves no memory of the city. And it becomes a kind of virtual memory. And you know, in the book, we have talked about it in the end. We were all there as a group obsessed about technology, about planning, about how all this was going to be organized. And as we finished our work, we were leaving. We went and said goodbye to a, a, a woman, Sadhu, who had helped us a lot. And we went to seek her blessings and to thank her for all the help she gave us. And after all our obsessions for eight or nine days with technology and planning, she merely said to us, she said, you must feel blessed that the goddess Ganges, the river, let you sit in her lap for a few days. So it was a completely poetic interpretation of a kind of virtual city that appears, but with amazing efficiency. It's almost poetic, because all then you're left with is an image of it that you carry, and you have to wait for 12 more years before it begins to uh, appear again. And so for us, this was a very interesting experience, because it was an experience that not only had these very sacred and poetic dimensions, we met people, for example, we met women in one of these neighborhoods who were making flower beds, beautiful flower beds, with flowers and watering it and tending the bed. And you know, if you ask them, why are you doing this? It's only for 55 days. They said, no, we are here to exercise detachment. We want to learn how we can detach ourselves from something that we become so invested in. And so there's an incredible poetic dimension. But there's also, of course, for all of us as a community of architects and planners, many other learnings. And I'll just end with some learnings that I think are important. One is the grid 
in the way it's used here was something we really understood from. And because the grid can sit with the river going through it, with changes, but every road becomes a bridge, makes the grid, grid very robust. So it was one of the most robust deployment of the grid that we saw in a way. The other was that it was also about this rapid deployment. Things could happen very fast because of those five materials. Because it was a combination of a grid where the government focused on the main infrastructure and people were allowed to organize themselves uh, in any way they wanted. And of course, people are careful about fire, people are careful about health in their own way. But the fact the government gives them so much uh, confidently for them to decide is an amazing learning that you have a very nice partnership between public and private because often in our cities the government, we are, the public is always trying to control the private uh, and then half our energy gets wasted in that sort of negotiation. Uh, and so those five materials were very important. The other was that uh, the public space had a lot of emphasis. There was a lot of public and community space. It wasn't just an obsession with residential. Eight people lived in a small tent because it was not about uh, private space. It was really about public space. And this was kind of very beautiful. People often ask us, why do you think this was successful? And uh, you know, and people compare it. I mean, in India, I'm always asked, if they could do the Kumbh Mela, why are cities such a mess? Uh, and uh, you know, of course, it's the logical question. But you know, I mean, I think uh, it's a wonderful place to be. But I think what we have to realize is it's also a city where there's only one purpose. This is, a, this is the world's largest Hindu Congress. Everyone goes there for a religious purpose. In our cities, there are many purposes. Everyone has different aspirations. And most of the problems come from the contestation of these multiple aspirations. So that is the reality. So we can't use this as a model per se, but I think we can learn from it. But I think what makes it successful is two or three things. One is it has a single purpose. Second, like an Indian wedding, in the last minute everything happens because in the wedding, even if families are fighting, they all smile at each other and help each other and make it happen. So it's like a big Indian wedding or any wedding, I'm sure, in Latin America where differences are put aside just to save the family face. Uh, and so that happens. And the third thing is I think uh, it's for a short time, you know. It's for 55 days. The energy you can put in when you know something is for 55 days is quite different when it, than when you know it's permanent. So one must also uh, uh, realize that. The interesting thing about it is that it, the material that comes in, and this I hope somebody will study in the future, we did not have time to study, is it, there's an interesting material geography because the material that comes to make the city comes from around where the city is made. But after the city is finished, it also goes back there. So the small villages that have a river but don't have a bridge, some of these bridges go there. The light poles go to villages to be used for electricity if they don't have electricity, etc. So there's a nice relationship to the hinterland, to the territory. And you know, urban design, architecture, planning in today's world, I think we have to realize it's not a city, it doesn't stop. It's the territory, it's, it's all one. And how we make this ecology by linking things to the broader territory is a big lesson. For the future, I think in 10 years, I hope I have the energy to go back. Uh, some of my colleagues have promised they're going to go back. I hope some of you will come. Maybe we should get all our universities to go back and build a campus for 55 days. Or something like that. But I think for the future, this idea of material geography will be worth experimenting and learning from the Kum uh, to see how it happens. I think energy will be a very big issue. Right now, all the electricity comes from the surrounding grid. But I think a challenge in 12 years would be to see how the energy systems work. Also, the sanitation, the disposal of waste, how that system works. Also, how information technology can be used in much more interesting ways. This is the first time there were cell phones. We have studied some of it, but it wasn't enough. I mean, we started studying this only six or nine months before the aim. I think someone should start studying this five years uh, before, and I think we will uh, learn a lot from it. But I think one lesson that we should keep in the, our minds for the future is this was the lightest city I've seen. The water disappears, the sand appears, very likely a city sits on it. Seven million people live there for 55 days. A hundred million people visit the city for, in those 55 days. And then it disappears without leaving any trace. And the lightness of it is also very beautiful. Thank you very much.
Oscar and Felipe, they, they were part of the team. Uh, they came and they lived there, uh, right? Uh, he also had a bath, uh, but his timing was wrong, so he's going to be reborn. <laughs> uh, but um, they were also collaborators on the book, on the project. They were part of the preparation seminar. Uh, so they are as much part of the project as anybody else and you know it's a fantastic uh, uh, occasion, it's coincidence, incident, partly planned, partly uh, by coincidence that we all three happened to be here and we all were kind enough to give us this occasion to share the work and Oscar is also someone who is involved here so I hope he, he will extend some of these discussions maybe in a, in a, in a productive way and, and Felipe likewise who uh, is not only the co-editor of this but uh, was very instrumental in um, taking this project forward. So I just thought this would be also a good occasion for us to have a conversation but for you to also comment on other things. I just did a very brief uh, you know, discussion. Thank you. Uh, so, something we can do. Uh, is it okay if we keep talking in English so we can engage for a whole? Yes. I think people. No, people have been laughing, so I don't think they can understand me. We can. We can. Vamos a mezclar un poco. No, lo que podemos hacer es este. Eh, eh, no, lo que podemos hacer es eh, de repente brevemente comentar nosotros también un poco cuáles fueron nuestros los, los big learning ¿no? de, de PUM brevemente y después podemos abrirlo también a, a preguntas del público este, digamos, de, lo, de lo que quieran ¿no? y nosotros igual pueden ser en español si lo traducimos a, a Raúl sí. eh, bueno, muchas gracias a todos por estar aquí eh, la verdad es que cada vez que hablamos del del PUM, yo un poco me emociono y cada vez que, que, que veo a Raúl hablar me acuerdo de un par de cosas más. Eh, una de las cosas que para mí es súper interesante y un poco también quiero, voy a traducirle a Raúl el, el, lo que voy a decir para que también salte un poco al tema, son dos cosas que nosotros, que nosotros eh, un poco elaboramos al final. Son, son, al final el libro termina con, uh, con un artículo que se llama, y espero que en algún momento lo puedan, lo puedan revisar, que se llama eh, Learning from the Ephemeral Magazine. Y, y trabaja sobre dos conceptos claves que nosotros creemos que en cierta medida pueden ser eh, fundamentales cuando pensamos en la manera en la cual estamos eh, generando nuestras ciudades y diseñando nuestras ciudades. Uno es la idea de lo reversible eh, y el otro es la idea de lo abierto. Eh, cuando pensamos en una ciudad de, que recibe 120 millones de personas, que tiene el tamaño de Manhattan, eh, que está construida con todo este material, la idea de que lo sustentable tiene que ver con la capacidad de las cosas para estar, para estar y para permanecer ahí, está un poco desafiada. Pareciera ser que algo, que algo que nos enseña esta ciudad es que la sustentabilidad quizás puede tener más que ver con, con cómo las cosas se pueden desensamblar, cómo las cosas pueden reabsorberse y cómo podemos pensar, comenzar a pensar en urbanismo o, o en cosas que a la escala urbana pueden ser reversibles. Entonces, eso es una de las cosas que, que yo encuentro súper interesante y que me gustaría quizás un poco abrirlo a, a, a los pensamientos de Oscar y los pensamientos de Raúl, como muchas veces nosotros hacemos soluciones, y Raúl siempre lo dice así, soluciones permanentes para problemas que no son permanentes. Y entonces, ¿cómo podemos empezar a pensar en formas urbanas que pueden, de una forma u otra, eh, reabsorberse, desensamblarse eh, y reversarse? Y la otra es una cosa que, que para nosotros es súper importante y súper interesante entender. Eh, esta ciudad que, que, más que, que más que un más que un outcome, más que un producto cerrado, más que un, un elemento construido, eh, es un proceso en constante movimiento. Eh, la noción de permanencia, la noción de lo cerrado, eh, es mucho menos presente que la ciudad física, que la, que, la, que la ciudad más permanente que nosotros conocemos. Entonces, la idea de lo abierto, que nosotros le decimos como openness, eh, y la idea de, de esta especie de relación entre una grilla, que es absolutamente... Eh, cerrada, eh, dura, eh, puesta súper desde arriba hacia abajo, como top down, versus, pero que, que es terminada por las mismas personas que ocupan la ciudad. Es decir, es como un trabajo incompleto, un trabajo abierto para ser terminado y llenado por los ocupantes de la ciudad. Es también algo muy interesante, que un poco nos habla de cómo, de cómo eh, podemos empezar a darle más poder a los mismos ocupantes o a los mismos... Eh, a los, al, 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 eh, 
eh, a las personas que utilizan la ciudad en la manera en la cual construimos la ciudad. Entonces, un poco son estas esta dos reflexiones, y ahí no sé, Oscar, si tú querés saltar, eh, sobre esta, esta, el potencial que tiene el CUM en su lección de lo reversible y el potencial que tiene en su lección de lo abierto a la escala urbana. Sí, este, lo coincido perfectamente con eso. Creo que fue una experiencia, probablemente haya sido el proyecto más alucinante en el que haya estado en mi vida eh, hasta ahora. Fue una experiencia riquísima y, y creo que, eh, digamos, es súper interesante eh, aprender sobre escenarios extremos. ¿no? O sea, esta es una ciudad realmente extrema y lo que nos permite eh, estudiar un caso como este es que en, en situaciones extremas realmente se pueden ver eh, ángulos ¿no? eh, y características de una ciudad que, que difícilmente en una ciudad normal podrían eh, revelarse de manera evidente. ¿no? Eh, y entonces, y eso de alguna manera también me, me trae una, una reflexión muy parecida a la, a la de Felipe, eh, que, que el, el Cummela de alguna manera eh, como pone en cuestión ciertos paradigmas eh, del urbanismo, ¿no? que de repente nosotros, en el caso de Perú, nos parecen un poco más naturales porque las, las dinámicas de los procesos urbanos, en el caso de Perú, este, son, son parecidos a, a los de la India, pero digamos en el mundo occidental eh, siempre ha habido un enfoque sobre eh, la, la forma urbana, ¿no? el estudio de la forma urbana y creo que, que el Cummela es una expresión eh, súper interesante de, de cambiar ese paradigma de estudiar procesos urbanos ¿no? y creo que eso eh, eh, lo refleja de manera súper específica ¿no? y tal como lo decía eh, Felipe cuando habla de la noción de lo, de lo abierto ¿no? eh, y bueno, el caso de Lima ¿no? y el caso de, 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 digamos, de cómo se han construido muchas de las ciudades aquí son también un, es, un escenario eh, similar solo que en este caso es extremo nuevamente como, como decía ¿no? lo otro, la otra dimensión eh, que creo que, que pone muy en cuestión es esta diferencia, ¿no? este paradigma que existe entre estudiar situaciones urbanas y situaciones rurales. ¿no? Existe siempre una eh, polaridad entre decir esto es urbano, esto es rural, y creo que el Gummela realmente pone eso en, en una cuestión súper extrema, ¿no? en donde, claro, durante, durante muchos años quizás, bueno, Alájabat es la ciudad que está cerca, por lo tanto es un territorio eh, urbanizado, pero eh, el mismo eh, eh, el parcela donde se ocupa la ciudad es, es digamos, digamos, rural durante eh, mucho tiempo y luego se convierte en un... En un paisaje absolutamente urbano, ¿no? Entonces, eh, yo creo que es bien interesante hablar de paisajes urbanizados, ¿no? Y eh, hablar sobre la idea de región, porque el hecho de que surja el, el Cummela no es solo la huella física eh, que ocupa, que es casi el tamaño de Manhattan, sino el estrés que genera en la región que permite que esto suceda, ¿no? Porque si uno tiene que imaginar la cantidad de agua que tiene que llegar para que eh, estas personas puedan este, beber, o la cantidad de alimento, o la cantidad de energía eléctrica, o sea, todos los recursos de la región se este, transforman para poder servir a una población que realmente, eh, digamos, viene cada 12 años, pero realmente altera ¿no? cómo se distribuyen los recursos y la energía en un territorio entero. Entonces, eso también me, me invita a la, a, la, a la reflexión. Lo otro es, eh, y también en, en este caso eh, se alinea mucho con eh, un contexto como el peruano, es la idea de la escala. ¿No? la escala de esta ciudad es la humana pero eh, casi podríamos decir que es eh, el, el ser humano como infraestructura ¿no? porque eh, hay muy, o sea, durante el, la construcción del Cumela hay muy poca maquinaria ¿no? igual India es un, es un país que tiene este, eh, digamos eh, en, en estas zonas pocos recursos no hay una supergrúa ni hay este, unos mega trailers y si hay algunos pues, pues se usan inteligentemente entonces lo interesante de esto es que justamente la escala como lo había hablado este, Rajul estos, estos cinco materiales que permiten que, que, que el ser humano que las personas vayan construyéndola progresivamente eh, hace que sea una ciudad incremental eh, y, y una ciudad que, 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 que es elástica también ¿no? esta dimensión que, que Rajul habla de la elasticidad es súper interesante porque permite expandirse y contraerse eh, dependiendo de, de, los, de los volúmenes de personas que llegan ¿no? y, este, y, y finalmente eso es bien bacán porque eh, explicó en algún momento por ejemplo la, la, cómo manejaban los márgenes del río eh, solo con, con un material que era los costalillos, de, los costalillos estos que vemos de arroz que son de plástico y arena ¿no? y entonces desde el día uno cuando uno empieza a manejar este, los, las riberas de los ríos este, las represas que se hacían, los canales eh, toda, la, toda la infraestructura eh, eh, hidráulica de esa ciudad solo fue hecho con bolsas de arena y, 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 los, y arena ¿no? 
Este, y entonces lo interesante de esto es que sabes que desde el día 1 se va a empezar a degradar. La velocidad de degradación de estas bolsas este, no dura los 55 días. Entonces, eh, el, el, los, los trabajadores eran esta, espe esta especie de, de factor permanente que iba eh, todo el tiempo reparando, reparando para que sea casi como un organismo vivo, casi como una célula que se va regenerando este, constantemente, ¿no? porque justamente estaba diseñado como para la, para la degradación. Eh, y a ver, hay otra dimensión que es bien interesante también es la, la velocidad, ¿no? que, que justo es lo que, lo que hablaba Raúl, lo comentaba Felipe que creo que aquí la, la velocidad también la marca del ser humano, pero también la naturaleza. ¿no? Es casi como diseñado con, con la naturaleza, donde hay un conocimiento muy profundo de las dinámicas ecológicas, de las dinámicas este, de, del territorio que permiten entenderlo y, 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 y estar preparados para ocupar el territorio cuando el río se, se quita. ¿no? Entonces, este, y simplemente quería terminar esto con una reflexión eh, interesante, que es el caso, o sea, los learnings, los, los aprendizajes que pueden haber para para casos como Perú, o sea, yo creo que Perú tiene eh, también manifestaciones este, extremas, manifestaciones culturales o situaciones o contextos que, que estudiarlos bajo estos paradigmas pueden ser muy interesantes, ¿no? bajo el paradigma o para la, la, la provocación, digamos, de este, entender eh, digamos, el, el, el tema de los procesos urbanos y el tema de los paisajes urbanizados. ¿no? Por ejemplo, tenemos eh, el, situaciones como el Señor de los Milagros, ¿no? Eh, la fiesta de Paco, Paco Tambo, la, la, la Candelaria, o también fenómenos este, naturales como, bueno, se nos viene un fenómeno del niño que realmente va a ser eh, aparentemente devastador y creo que también es una oportunidad interesante para estudiarlo como un proceso de, este, de reajustes y, 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 y estreses, digamos, del, del territorio en el que va a pasar, eh, el tema de los terremotos, ¿no? Este, creo que, que el Cummer es un, 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 un ejemplo súper interesante de entender esto como un solo proceso eh, cuando en verdad nosotros usualmente lo que hacemos al abordar un, eh, un, un fenómeno natural como esto es dividirlo en tres momentos, ¿no? Esta es la etapa de prevención, la etapa de emergencia y la etapa de reconstrucción. Y creo que lo que nos ha mostrado Raúl ahora es, un, es, un, es una continuación súper orgánica de, de entender todo como un solo fenómeno que, que no tiene por qué verse este, como, como un solo evento en, 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 durante un solo día, ¿no? Eh, y bueno, podría seguir hablando de esto, pero creo que estamos también cortos de tiempo y no sé, igual lo abro eh, a preguntas del público este, que podemos nosotros traducir para, para Raúl. ¿Alguien, a, ¿Alguien tiene alguna pregunta que quisiera hacer en español y nosotros la largely Uttar Pradesh. That's why public-private. The public is the main infrastructure. So the roads, the water supply, the sewage, the bridges, uh, all that is paid by the government. And then different private groups uh, within Hinduism, so these are different gurus, their priests, their followers, they apply for allocation of land. And there's a system of that application that you have to they, they make sure that it's not just people who are coming there to have fun or something, but it's really legitimate. And then they are allocated the land. And once they're allocated the land, within that they do their self-organization. They pay for it themselves. Their followers give them money or they collect money, but it's all right. Have you a question here? Yes. No me quedo muy en claro esto de los materiales que utilizan para hacer las, como las tiendas, estas separaciones, ¿esos materiales los queman todos al final o como que se los llevan y los vuelven a traer para el siguiente, para cada 12 años? ¿O cuánto tiempo podrían durar si es que no se llegara a, si no hubiera el monstruo en este? Ah, ya, de hecho, eh, una cosa súper interesante que nos dijimos cuando, cuando se hace la quema, 
se quema lo que queda. Pero la gran mayoría de los materiales tienen que ver con actividad de reversibilidad, tiene que ver con que estos cinco materiales no son solo importantes que sean estos cinco, sino que la tecnología con la cual, con la cual estos se modifican. Se, hacen una, se modifican, se, se ensamblan de una manera en la cual casi no se toca, casi no se destruyen. Y por tanto, una vez que la ciudad se acaba, ellos se van a todas las ciudades cercanas y son parte de las ecologías de la construcción de esas ciudades. Es decir, lo que en un minuto ahí en esa ciudad parece ser una carpa, después se convierte en otra parte, no sé, en, en un pequeño templo o, o, o una placa de metal se utiliza para otra cosa. Entonces, digamos que el 80% del material que se ve en esa ciudad es completamente eh, reabsorbido por la... Por, la, o sea, por eso yo digo que algo súper interesante de esta ciudad es que no es solo la escala, pero que probablemente es el ejemplo de, de reciclaje más grande, más grande que uno puede haber. O sea, todo es reciclado. Eh, y lo único que sí se trae de vuelta son los puentes. Los puentes, eh, estos puentes flotantes, gran parte de ellos en el mismo estado se guardan... Porque el CUM pasa todos los años una vez al año, muy chiquito. Pasa un poco más grande cada tres años, pasa la mitad de grande cada seis y pasa gigante cada doce. Entonces... Eh, Dependiendo, dependiendo el tamaño y la escala en el año que toca, cuántos de estos, de estos, eh, de estos puentes traen, de estos puentes flotantes traen. Los otros también los usan en el desastre natural de cerca, cuando necesitan desplegar un puente provisorio por alto tiempo, etc. Pero fuera de los puentes, todo el resto es completamente reabsorbido y lo que se quema son, son las pequeñas cosas que quedan en el suelo. Sí. sí, aquí. Eh, la sexualización. Very, very good question. So, uh, the sector allocations are broadly, so there are about 12 groups, there are 12 sects, which are, they're called akharas. Uh, not cast, they're just there are five groups. Uh, they're called Akharas. They were originally religious groups. But these are the oldest ones, 12, uh, nine, nine of them which are the oldest. So they get one sector, uh, which is very much in the center, because a lot of people want to go there to meet the priests. And the Juna Akhara, which is the oldest Akhara, is given a center spot within the sector. Then one sector is all the administration. So the police main headquarters, the administrative offices, uh, the hospital, the one or two major ones, so it's an administrative. The other sectors are all four different groups and it's a process of allocation. So you have to be a registered religious group. So you know Hinduism is very broad and very plural. So even for example the Dalai Lama has uh, often gone there to speak because Buddhism is a reform movement of Hinduism. So it's seen like it's under the broader umbrella of Hindu. So like the Hare Rama, Hare Krishna people. So these are all these new Hindu groups that are, but it's all under the broad umbrella of Hinduism. So there are many, many groups like that. So you have to register. So the government then makes sure that you are a registered group. Some people are registered for now six uh, times, so which means for uh, 36 years, more 72 years. So they are part of the government record. Every time in 12 years, new groups come for registration and the government has to really check because some of them are doing it for real estate speculation because then they sell the tents for people who want to come and they're not part of a group. So this is a very tricky thing. And when we were there, I remember I was there one day with the main officer and he said, sit, sit, just stay in the room. Now there are these groups coming to convince me they are a religious group, but I know that they are a real estate group. And then he would reject them. Uh, so uh, every maybe every 12 years there are 100 new groups who apply and from the 100 new groups maybe 6 or 8 are given space there. Thank you. Thank you. There are many reasons why the city as an urban phenomenon emerge. It might be political, commercial, etc. Now, eh, in the case of the 
In all the previous cases, there is a particular energy. It might be a political energy, a commercial energy, or even a catastrophe. No. In, in this case, intriga saber si esa energía que permite realmente eh, producir una ciudad con esa celeridad y con esta de una forma tan completa no se origina fundamentalmente en sus motivaciones religiosas. In this particular case, I would like to know if it's the energy that produces the city is particularly related to its religious uh, reason. Very much, very much uh, related to its religious uh, reason. The, and this is a very important question for the next one, because uh, the, the history of this is partly this virtual imagination that there are five days every 12 years where the alignment of the planets happen and it's sacred, and if you have a bath, you're free from rebirth, so it's a sacred moment. So that is one imagination it's a very powerful imagination that draws people. And the amount of old people that come there is incredible because uh, you know, towards the end of their lives they come there. One of the NGOs that I showed, their job, they've been an NGO for 60 years and their job is to save the women that are abandoned. A lot of old women are bought there and the families abandon them uh, because they don't want to look after them and they feel that this is now they've had a bath, this is the end of you know whatever their existence is. So there are many complex problems like that, but there are enough indicators that tell us that that imagination draws people there in a very powerful way. So that gives it a lot of energy in terms of the common people that are there. But on top of that, it is also the largest, it is the only, or it's the largest Hindu Congress in the world. And Hinduism, in terms of numbers, is the biggest religion, just a number of people that are because of the large population in India. And a lot of the priests uh, who come and they organize themselves, originally and even now, they come for interaction because they spend the 12 years in the caves, they, they live remotely. Sometimes they meditate for 12 years alone, doing yoga every day, living in a cave in a mountain. So they meet human beings for the first time in 12 years and they actually exchange. They have meetings where they exchange their insights and their philosophy and all of that. And for a lot of the young priests who are part of these religious groups, also it's a point, point where they come and they interact and they learn. It's like a university also for those 55 days. Now this has become an interesting question for the future because we were talking to one of the priests from the oldest uh, groups, the Juna Kara, and he was saying now all his young followers, they have Facebook pages, and so they have virtual addresses, and they talk to people now over the internet, and so they were just speculating that in the future, uh, that one reason for that energy that you're talking about might actually go away, because even uh, the religious leaders might have other ways of connecting with information, of talking to each other, seeing what each of the sects are thinking. Uh, but I think the imagination that having the bath will be powerful enough. But I think I, my personal speculation is that it will also become a bit of an amusement park because people will come there for that purpose but then they will look for other forms of entertainment, not the religious dialogue that they have at the moment because this is where what the internet does None of us can imagine what the future will be. Does that answer your question? Yes. One additional thing. Esa cree que esa motivación religiosa puede eventualmente ser transferida a esa energía religiosa que produce este fenómeno urbano puede ser transferida a otros a otras instancias sociales, a instancias cívicas, a instancias por Lo que, lo que encuentro un tanto dudoso, me parece maravillosa la, la experiencia que, hemos sido, que ha sido mostrada, pero no veo tan fácil que la energía que hay detrás de eso se pueda transferir a otros terrenos de la actual de la 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 de other 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 situation. The question or, or the thing no here's the question. So <laughs> he, he likes the presentations a lot, but he, the, but he would like uh, but he sees a very difficult 
a literal translation between what we have done and present and the way in which cities work. So what happened with that energy? How can we translate that energy? Yeah. So, you know, uh, what, uh, that's a very interesting question and that's why I ended it by saying we should not, it should not, it, there's no direct translation because there are many differences between real cities and, but this is a, it's actually a forum uh, for many things. So if my colleagues from the School of Religion had presented today, which I didn't because, you know, uh, they do it better and I mean I should have maybe because your question is, is important. For them, the biggest observation in from the School of Religion was that a lot of the groups, the religious groups were beginning to talk about environmental issues. So environmentalism was one of the main themes in the discussion among the religious groups this time. And that is very important and very powerful. And I think this is the kind of thing you're asking, that how does so, it, it's very interesting that, that's why for me the next, the next one in 10 years will be fascinating, because this time the big discussion on environmentalism started because they said the same river that we are praying to, that we think is the goddess, is actually polluted. Uh, and there are a lot of the campaigns in, among the religious different groups was environmentalism. Uh, and, uh, and similarly public health. Uh, can become a big issue uh, through this. And so, uh, the, the, the religious discussion, I think, uh, in its own uh, mythical way, will I believe will disappear just because of what the internet is doing. And this will become a forum where religion or organizing people uh, around the idea of faith will have other issues that will make people come together to believe in something. And I think environmentalism is a big one that seems to emerge this time. And my colleagues from the School of Religion, their research was focused on this issue. Archaeologists want to control everything. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can joke with her, she's one of my students, so that's, I can joke with her. But, you know, I think it's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, no, it's an important question. And here, of course, memory is, it's what is an enacted process. It's a, it's, it's a moment, no? But I think, you know, you're, you're taking this in a different direction. I hope I'll spend more time on this question on Monday when I do my lecture, so I'll be just very brief. I think this is a cultural thing, meaning I think different cultures deal with conservation and what you call archaeology in a completely different way and I think one has to accept that. I think we are trying to create and we've had many debates about this and so, but uh, it's, I think we are trying to create a universal category or approach to conservation. That's a big problem. I think every culture must deal with this completely differently. Earlier I was saying to someone that 
for me, conservation and its extension to archaeology is one instrument of planning to modulate the rate of change. And different societies and different cultures can can take a lot of change, some can't. In England, they can't take any change. So if the queen walks on a carpet, they conserve it, you know. I mean, they, they go to that extreme. And there's some societies like China, for other political reasons, social reasons, accept change. Then they react to it because they think change has been too fast. So change is, I think nothing is permanent. Uh, we, we somehow want to believe that it will be permanent. We first start with the obsession of our own bodies in terms of preservation, and then we fail and we accept reality. But with buildings and artifacts, we tend to extend it. But I think this is different in every culture, and one must respect that. In some cultures, I think, uh, you know, I mean, I think the question of change is one thing, and within that, there's memory. There are many other more emotional aspects which make it a very complex discussion, so it's not a very easy one. But it really is about controlling change, and I think every culture, every city within a country will have different attitudes to that. And I think the challenge for us as architects, planners, urban designers, academics, is to develop very particular narratives for conservation for our locations. And not worry about, and this is a problem I believe with UNESCO and World Heritage Sites and things like that. It's like globalization. We are trying to create these global categories for everything. Uh, and this is a much more complex discussion, and if you're here on Monday, I will actually present a whole section in my lecture about this in India, uh, which you have probably heard about uh, many times when you were a student, but uh, uh, I think it's a very important issue for the future. And I think in some ways the Kumela also teaches us one extreme form of that, where it is about detachment, so you can be obsessed with something, but at some point we also as society have to learn how to let it go. And sometimes in letting it go, there's more value than in keeping it. So that might be one way to do it. Bueno, queremos este, reiterar una vez más la invitación a todos a venir el lunes a las 7 de la noche, y que la exposición del arquitecto Merotra va a tratar sobre su obra, y agradecerle su presencia acá. Y el libro va a estar en la biblioteca de la universidad para que cualquiera lo pueda consultar. And I want to also just acknowledge Jose Mayoral, who was one of the coordinators for this book, who happens to be here. Bueno, muchas gracias.